Bueno, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm also speaking in Spanish. <laughs> uh, I want to welcome you uh, to another week of uh, worshiping God here in Sojourn. Uh, we are thankful that you are here with us, that you are joining us from your homes. Um, it's a beautiful, we had a beautiful week in Portland, and we are just praising God for that, the faithfulness of Him. And to start today, I want to read a passage. It's Second Corinthians 4. 16 to 18. So we do not lose heart, though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us an eternal way of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So as we are uh, still dealing with a pandemic in the world, I uh, wanted us to be encouraged by the Word of God that even when we don't see the Word of God, He is working. He's working for the good of the church he's working for the good of you at your house for the work he's working for the good of the people that don't know him yet so let's keep the faith and praying um, that god can reveal himself through this um, so please join me to pray in this morning to start thank you father for your word and the time that we have to gather around uh, i would say the glow to worship you uh, in the midst of this, um, thank you for technology. Thank you for um, that you have in place uh, internet and computers that we can uh, see each other, that we can talk with each other and just be in tune with your body. Thank you for all my brothers and sisters that are in this morning ready to listen from the word, ready to worship you, Father. Thank you for... Um, the work that you are doing in the midst of our lives, um, even the stuff that we don't see, we don't know, we know you are working for the good of um, your name. We love you, Father. In your name I pray. Amen. Now we will worship with Jacob. Thanks, Andrea. Well, feel free to stand wherever you're at, and we're going to begin this morning in worship. Bow before the lion and 
overwhelming, never ending, the reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found and leaves the 99. Well, I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Thank you, Lord, um, that you are good. We believe it, that you are good in every season. Um, yeah, Lord, I pray that if it's hard to see, that we still believe it in our hearts and in our minds. Um, that day by day we can look around and know that we are so blessed. Um, to know you, to be with you. I pray that over anything that we just want to be with you, that that is our one desire, and that us being with you is ultimately the only thing that satisfies us. We love you, and it's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. 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 Well, I would say feel free to have a seat if you're standing up, because I'll invite Matt to come up. <laughs> I love our, our transitions uh, during this time. Well, good morning, church. My name is Matt, pastor of Sojourn Church. If you are new with us and joining us online, uh, this is our fifth week of doing joint online gatherings between Sojourn and Eastbridge Church. And I'll just be honest, I miss gathering with God's people. I desperately miss getting together and just fellowshipping and enjoying one another's company as we seek to grow in the Lord. And hopefully, one day soon, we'll be able to do that aside from this, this online face. And I imagine you're like me. You're probably just as desperate to get back to where we can just gather as God's people together. Uh, in the meantime, we are committed to educating ourselves as things change still daily and weekly. Uh, we're trying to pivot and uh, learn as we go. Uh, we know we're not doing things perfectly, but we are trying our best just to communicate, over-communicate with you and just let you know of adjustments and things that are coming up. And so one of the benefits I have noticed to this whole online phase is that churches all over the country are having a, a higher number of attenders in their gatherings. Now, I don't say that because we're all about the numbers. Uh, I even saw uh, one church planter was embellishing and saying that for each viewer, there was about seven people represented, which I don't know where he got that. Um, that number from. But the reason I bring that up is that some of you are new to joining us. Some of you aren't part of Eastbridge. Some of you aren't part of Sojourn. And, and maybe you're not a supporter or partner from another part of the country, but you somehow found us online and we're so glad to have you with us. But it's worth mentioning, we also have three midweek groups between our two churches. Um, what, though we get together to just fellowship and to grow in our relationship with the Lord and to grow in our love for one another. And so if that interests you, please let us know that. Um, put it in uh, the chat bar there on the screen, or you can email info at sojournpdx.org because we would just love to get you connected further. Um, of course, in this weird phase, it is also online on Zoom, uh, but it allows us just to interact with each other a little bit better. And so I just want to make sure I plug that opportunity for you so that you know there's more than, than just the, the piece that we're doing this morning as much as we do value this gathering as well. Last week, we took a break from our series, uh, A Living Faith, because it was Easter Sunday. And um, once I get into today's message, you'll realize why we took a break from it. Um, but we are jumping back into the book of James, where we've been looking at what does it mean for the people of God to not only have a faith in word, to not only check a box whenever we have to fill out our senses to say that I'm a Christian, but what does it actually look like for the people of God to have a living faith? What does that mean to actually put into action the things that we claim and, and to actually live out the faith that we claim to have? As we jump back in this morning, I want to remind you that James is the half-brother of Jesus. And James knows how we feel this week. He knew what it was like to experience the power of the cross that we celebrated last weekend. But it was actually later in life, I found this interesting, that, that James recognizes Jesus for God, that James finally realizes that his half-brother all along, that he's gotten a front row seat to Jesus, who is the God of the universe. And so I can imagine a lot of his life, especially once he came to that conclusion, they probably reflected back over the years 
on what it was like playing with his brother Jesus and what it was like having meals with his brother Jesus. I mean, can you imagine being the brother of Jesus, Jesus who never sinned and who, who you constantly made all of these mistakes and that you were the one who was always blamed for the wrong, but and the reality is that you were the one who was in the wrong. I think about siblings. I've got two older sisters. Um, one of them, or maybe both of you watching this morning, I've got my three boys, so I get to see them be siblings with one another. But siblings are known for, for fighting with one another, and they, they bicker with one another. And one of the things that siblings are known to do is we will use harmful words with one another. I wonder how many times James sinned against his brother Jesus by using words, something, something to, to hurt him, to be painful towards him. And so what we're going to see this morning is James is going to get really practical for us. He's going to come down to a level that just says, this is how you live out this aspect of your faith. And what he's going to do is he's going to focus on the smallest member, one of the smallest members, I should say, of our bodies. He's going to focus on our tongue. So I would say everyone touch your tongue, but it's coronavirus season, so do not touch your tongue. But if you're watching, you can stick it out and say, like, this is what we're going to be looking at today and the power that your tongue has. And so he's addressing this to the early church, but he's also addressing it to us today. And he wants us to look at the power and importance that our words have and and how it is that we can be harmful or that we can be helpful with the tongue. And so the main purpose this morning of this sermon is that we'll see that the tongue is uncontrollable and that it's capable of harmful effects and a true indicator of our hearts. So what I mean by that is what comes out of our mouths, the words that we use with our tongue actually reveal much more of what's internally inside of us rather than, than, than something else. But also there's good news that God has a gracious provision for the gospel and he can redeem our tongues as well. And so this portion of James, it really relates to the set of verses that we looked at two weeks ago. So I know we took the break, uh, the week off, and so we may have to refresh our memories a little bit. Maybe after this, you flip through and read some of these passages. But the first thing we see is that there was a concern about, wor- about words in this paragraph is loosely connected with the concern about works in chapters 2, verses 14 through 26. In James 2.24, I remind you, he says, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And so just this idea that you can claim a faith, but what is it that you're actually living it out? And so he's going to say now that our tongues, those words, also relate to those works. The second thing is that this long section on the problem of the tongue picks up James' identification of the control of the tongue as one of the clearest examples of what he calls true religion, or, or what we would say in modern language is the ways of living out the ways of Jesus. And so that once again, our tongues reveal a lot about who we are. It's easy to check a box. It's easy to say, I'm a Christ follower, or I'm a Christian, or I'm a disciple, or whatever word it is that you put next to your name. But then does your, does your works, and does, in this case, does your words reveal that, that you actually are following Jesus? And we look at the life of Jesus and the speech that he used with us. And so what we're going to see is this paragraph of these verses are going to unfold in four stages. The first is we're going to see the first couple of verses. He's going to introduce the issue by warning people who want to be teachers about the peculiar difficulty of controlling the tongue. Second, we're going to see the incredible power of the tongue in this theme of verses 3 through 6, which will be summarized in verse 5a when it says, The tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. The third phase is we'll see as powerful as the tongue is, is that it's extremely difficult to keep our tongues under control. Maybe you're someone who's watching this morning and you can relate to that very much. Don't, if you're sitting next to that person, please do not point at them and don't make this awkward, at least not yet. And then the fourth phase will be verses 9 through 12. We'll see that the passage will end on a note typical for James throughout this letter. It's to say the tongue reveals its evil nature by by manifesting the doubleness, which is typical of sin. And so James is going to take us all the way back to chapter 1, verse 19. He says, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Now, some of you are likely thinking right now that you just got out of needing to listen to the next 30 minutes of this sermon. And you're thinking, Matt, I don't talk a lot. And if you guys know me very well, you're thinking, Matt, you talk a lot. In fact, you talk a lot every single week. The person gets up and does an introduction and it's like two minutes and then you get up there for 30 minutes or 35 or 40 minutes sometimes and you're thinking, I don't don't need to listen to this. But here's what I want to tell you. You still talk a lot. Let me explain. You might be someone who who know on the outside you don't talk a lot, that you'd be that, that quiet person who's over in the corner oftentimes 
Maybe you're the person who doesn't say a whole lot whenever you're in a, in a small group, but you're still talking all the time. Even though I'm the one up here talking in front of the camera right now, some of you are still talking, but it just happens to be internal in nature, or maybe not since I can't actually hear you or see you this morning. But once again, we kind of have to pretend in this phase that we're all in the same room. Others of you, you're engaged, you're locked in, but you're still having an internal conversation. And what you're, what you're asking yourself is, do I intellectually agree with whether or not I want to listen to Matt speak or whether I want to listen to this sermon? Or maybe others of you are locked in, you've got your attention on your screen, your device, but you're really only giving about 10% of your attention because the other 90% is probably looking at, at something else in your room, which is, once again, we're online, so it's understandable, but you may be making internal judgment calls right now. You may be making a judgment on the clothing that Jacob or myself decided to wear. You may be making a judgment on the fact that Jacob wore a hat to lead worship. You may be making a judgment on my hair or the length of my beard or something else. Or maybe others of you are just wholly checked out and you're thinking, man, I just woke up. Like, I just woke up right now, like in the middle of you saying this sentence and I logged in and, man, I'm hungry. Like, what am I going to eat for breakfast? Or if you already had breakfast, you're thinking, what am I going to have for lunch today? Once again, naturally on this online phase, this is, this is an obvious challenge. Well, you know, we're all sitting on my couch with my three children in my household this morning, so I get that. But even if we were together in person, that would be the case. And now some of you self-classify or identify as an introvert, or maybe you even took a test that told you you are an introvert. I would say that's the majority of Portland in my experience. And so you're thinking, man, I'm off the hook here. No, that doesn't get you off the hook. If I've learned anything about you introverts, I love you guys. I'm just not one of you, but I do love you. And those of you that classify that way, you actually talk all the time. Now just hang with me because you might be thinking, what are you talking about? Your conversations are just internal in nature. And internal conversations tend to actually be the most dangerous ones. The reason I know that is sometimes I would say that, you know, I talk a lot and I'm a verbal processor, which means you know what I'm thinking. It's rare you have to question, what is Matt thinking? And so my mouth can easily get me into trouble, which James is going to show us. But those of you who are more internal in nature and a little bit more introverted in nature, you're talking just as much, if not more than I am. It's just it's internal, so it's very dangerous. So at least I'm expressing what I'm thinking and feeling, and then my, my faith community can come around me and say, Matt, you are off in your thinking here, or brother, let's, we need to love you and guide you and direct you in this way. But when nobody knows what you're actually thinking, and we're all kind of left with this puzzled look on our faces, that's when it can be very, very concerning, because our own thoughts left unchecked can go to, take us to a very, very dark place. I've had enough counseling appointments in my 10 years of vocational ministry to know this. And this is how most people, well, when they get to that place of self-harm and we all question, how did they get there? Like that, that seemed impossible, that individual. I think that's one of those things is that as their thoughts start going in their head and they start getting off to this place and they don't share it with anybody else. And just so you know, we take that very seriously as a church. And we want to continue to educate ourselves as a church on how to respond when somebody finds themselves in that place. And so we're going to work through this together, and James is going to help us self-diagnose our problem with our tongues. Now, I remember as a kid, when we get into, flat, into fights on playgrounds, a lot of times it turned into a, a verbal altercation, right? We weren't necessarily allowed to throw the punch on the playground or to throw the rock, because then I had to miss recess for the next week, and nobody wanted to do that. But we would throw hurtful words, insults. And maybe you remember, if you're like me as a kid, we would say this little thing back to people. We'd say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me. Now, here's the reality that we all realize years later, when we're no longer that kid on the playground, that is the furthest thing from the truth. If anything, it should be the exact opposite. It should be, sticks and stones will break my bones and cause temporary pain, but hurtful words will stick with me forever. Now, James is going to say more about that about halfway through our passage. So kind of hang on to that idea and, and that, um, that saying we used to throw out there on the playground. And remember with me how James ended chapter 1 with verse 26. He said, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. And so one of those marks of a, of a true, authentic Christian is your behavior is the control of your speech that you are able to control your tongue. That yes, you may have that thought that does come from within. Remember, James kind of builds on all these weeks for us. 
that you're able to control that and say, you know what, I'm going to take that thought captive and give it to the Holy Spirit because that thought is wrong. I'm not, I'm not going to express that. I'm not going to voice that. You ever find yourself going, I'm just biting my tongue right now. I'm just holding my tongue. And so if you haven't already, go ahead and turn with me to the book of James. We're going to be in chapter 3, where we're going to start in verse 1. And so I'm going to pray for us as we get started. And once again, it's James chapter 3, verse 1. God, I thank you for another morning where we can gather. God, even, even online, it still is a poor substitute if we're completely honest. But God, we're thankful that we have technology to do that. I think about other pandemics that happened throughout history and just think they didn't have ways to hardly communicate with one another other than if they lived next door. God, that this whole idea of online and, and, and people being able to do Zoom calls and, and Facebook, all these things just didn't even exist. And so, God, we do thank you that we're able to still have a form of gathering, God, as, as your people. And God, this morning I ask that your spirit would speak to us as James gets really practical with us on what it is to have a living faith, but specifically when we look at one of the smallest members of our bodies and our tongue and our speech and how it is that your people are marked by the words that they used. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, James 3, verse 1. It says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So James starts out saying, Those of us in a position to teach, which I would say as a kind of a side note, that really includes all Christians because we're all called to be disciple makers. That's on the forefront of what we do as Christ followers. And so I feel like there is a component of teaching when you're doing disciple making. But specifically, he's addressing those in, in public settings or, or kind of the setting we're doing this morning. So what, what I'm standing up here doing is saying, you will be judged with greater strictness. Now you think about teachers in the early church. They were very important. But they also saw this group that were really ambitious, like almost, almost too ambitious to become teachers because they wanted to do it for the wrong reasons. Because they wanted to get kind of puffed up themselves and say, you know, look at me. Now we still see this a lot in the church. Um, that's actually one of the things I'm hoping will actually come out of this this whole shutdown and us not being able to do things as normal is that so many Christ followers in the church typically look at the teachers and the preachers and the pastors and think, man, they're the only ones who can do this and can only do ministry. They they're all have their proper place. But I'm here to tell you that ministry is for every single one of us. And I'm hoping that people realize that as we can't depend on the, the, the people who are up um, front on Sunday morning, so to speak. But he says there's going to be a greater responsibility that comes with that because there's going to be a greater expectation from the Lord. And the teachers will be judged with a greater strictness as they are held accountable for more. So that's why I, I do my best to put in my study and to seek the Lord and read through these verses and to, to eventually go to the commentaries and look at the original languages because I know that I'm going to be judged and held accountable for the teaching that I'm giving to you, church. And so I want you to know that I take that study very seriously. And then we see this idea that when we undertake to guide others in our faith, we must be careful to exhibit the fruit of the faith the way that we live. So it's one thing to teach something. It's one thing to hand over a study. But then how is it that we actually live that out ourselves? And then he moves into verse 2. He says, for, for we all stumble in many ways. I think that's where we would all say amen. We all stumble in many ways. And he says, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, man, that'd be nice. He is a perfect man able also to bridle his whole body. So James is saying, church, we all stumble. It's the obvious. And he says, if you don't stumble, which is impossible, but if for some reason you don't, then you are a perfect person, which you're not because we all stumble. This is a universal problem. This is your problem. This is my problem. This is the problem of the whole world. But then he goes on to say, a person's words, they reflect his or her character and therefore, it's a key to their entire being. And so James has emphasized for us already this idea that good works, but he's also acknowledging that all Christians stumble in many ways. And so James calls us to good works. He says, therefore, we must not be seen as expecting perfection. But he says that a person who can control his tongue, his mouth, is a perfect man. Now, what he probably means there, he probably has a view, the idea of absolute perfection. Not that, that in the moment that you're perfect, because we're all hopefully attaining to be able to get control in our speech. Hopefully you can look back at two, three, four, five years ago, how you, the language you maybe used before you became a Christian, or the words that you would use and that you've, you've hopefully grown in, in, in the, uh, your speech and the words that you use. 
And so it is perfection. However, that will ultimately only be attainable in heaven. But he does say that, that Christ followers, believers, that we should always be growing in our holiness. And one of the ways that we grow in our holiness is by the word that we use. And so his basic thought process is this. If you can control your tongue, then you can likely control every member of your body. Right? Because isn't the tongue that one thing? Like It seems like I can control my hand from not slapping somebody across the face. I can control my foot from not sticking out and tripping somebody. But it seems like my mouth and my tongue is that one thing that, that I, and I hope I'm not alone in this, but that I'll struggle and I'll just say something in the heat of a moment. You know, I'll, I'll be in an argument with Andrea and I'll just throw something out there and then right away, it's like as soon as it comes out, I wish I could grab it like it was on a rope or a chain and kind of put it back in and swallow it. But unfortunately, I still consistently make that mistake. It's that one member that's so hard to control. And so he says in verse three, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. They, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So our words, James has now made clear, they have an enormous impact on our spiritual condition. Now each of these illustrations, is they're found widely in the ancient world. We might see them and say, this seems kind of funny in the context of urban Portland. But he's saying just as bizarre as it is that you can control a huge animal with a small bit. I mean, think about it. Get a little bit and you put it in their mouth. Think about horses and it, it guides them to the left or to the right or if they should go straight or if they should stop or slow down or go faster. You know, think about those huge horses. That, that, that little thing can control them. And he says, and then we have these huge ships. And it's just this tiny little rudder that will control where it is that they go. And how bizarre that seems to us. He said, the tongue is the same way to your body. The same way to, to how it is that you express yourself. And next he's going to show us the surprising pain that we can cause by our words, if you pick up in verse 5. He says, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire their entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Now, now most of us, I would think, remember the Eagle Creek Fire. It was the destructive uh, fire in the Columbia River Gorge that started on September 2nd, 2017. It was started by a 15-year-old boy igniting a firework during a burn ban. The fire went on to burn 50,000 acres of land, and it burned for three months before they declared that it was completely contained. To this day, I mean, September 2017, so we're only about, what, six months off of it being three years, there are still trails that are closed because of this fire. You know, I, I had moved here in June 2017, so there's still trails and hikes that I have longed to go on that I haven't been able to go on because of this. And James is saying that that small spark that ignited that firework and that eventually went on to burn 50,000 acres is the same way that our tongue is to our bodies. He says it may be one of the smallest members of your body, but it is the potential to be one of the most powerful and destructive in its impact. And so our tongue, it almost starts out like, like that, little, that little spark that ignites that firework. But it can have the damage and destructiveness of burning 50,000 acres of land. Remember that phrase that we would sing as kids about sticks and stones? And we said that's the, actually the complete opposite of the truth. Think about it. If you've ever, if you've ever broken a bone, I, I fractured or broke something in my finger playing basketball a few months ago, and it hurt. I mean, my finger was kind of hanging, dangling down. And so if you've ever broken a bone, an arm, a toe, something, you know that man, it hurts in the moment. But worst case scenario, in most cases, about six months, year in, at, at max, sometimes it's like a month or two months, Everything's back to normal. Everything's functioning normally. And you might have a scar, but there's, there's no remnants of that break any longer. But what about our words? What about those words that are used to insult you or that you've used to insult someone else? They cause all kinds of pain. Those words that existed for mere seconds as a phrase was thrown out there but then you end up carrying the weight of them with you for years to come. In some cases for you, this may have led to a, a broken relationship with a friend or maybe a broken relationship with a family member. 
And for some of you, this has maybe even led to therapy or counseling over hurtful words that were thrown out there to you. Maybe it was something over, over your weight or, or maybe something harmful over your skin color or, or maybe something harmful over your ethnicity or, or maybe something harmful over your accent or, or maybe something harmful from the, the side of the train tracks that you grew up on or the area of your city where you grew up. I don't know what it necessarily was, but something was thrown out there that was harmful and hurtful towards you. It's possible that someone listening this morning was told that you are a failure at life, and you will never attain to anything. And as much as you try to put that past you, as much as you try to put that in the rearview mirror, if you're really honest, it still crushes you deep down inside as you've believed that lie from someone for years. And so James is going to come in, he's going to reiterate it for us, his point in verse 7. He says, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So James goes back again and says, we are able to train so many things, including wild animals. I don't know if any of you have watched Tiger King. I'm not advocating that you watch it, but I may or may not have watched it on Netflix. I know a lot of people are, are watching that. So you see like these wild beasts have been trained, yet we cannot tame the tongue. Psalm 140, verse 3, says, They, evil men, make their tongues as sharp as serpents. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Romans 3, 13, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Here's the reality, church. We will likely never reach the point where our tongue is perfectly controlled. In the heat of an emotionally intense situation, just recently, I, I threw out some language that I normally shouldn't use and wouldn't use. That's the reality. I came home and confessed it to my wife. I said, hey, I got into this heated discussion. And you know what I did without even thinking? I just threw the gauntlet out there, so to speak. And I threw this language out there. But I can trust and we can trust that the Holy Spirit is continuing to use our speech to glorify God. Think about our tongues. That's what, that's what it's for. That's why we have Jacob come up here at the beginning and Jacob will come at the end. We kind of bookend our gathering, so to speak, with this idea of, of worship, the way that we should be using our tongues to praise our Heavenly Father, to give glory to the God of the universe. And James, James in, in verse 9, he says, with, our, with it, meaning our tongues, he says, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. We must remember, church, we bear the image of God. And so James is echoing Jesus. And he says, your circumstances don't change what is going on in your heart. Just because you get into a, a, a certain situation, that's just revealing what's already there. He says, your circumstances reveal what eternally was already in your heart beforehand. This is a huge reason that Jesus is not all that compelling in our culture because people in our culture don't really think they're that bad. People don't think that, that man, that, that was inside of me? Like, why did you do that? Well, I know exactly why you did that. James has told us why we do that. Jesus told us why we do it because it's already inside of us. Remember, he's, he's pointing all the way back to the very beginning of this, this um, series in James. He's saying that those temptations, those things you give into, once they are fleshed out, once they reveal themselves, and we might, we might kind of stand back and go, like, oh my goodness, I never thought that individual would do that. Or oh my goodness, I never thought I would do that. Or how did, you might be sitting there this morning thinking, how did I find myself in this situation? And James saying, it was there all along. And Jesus points out as well, said, because ultimately left to our own, it's just, it's, it's just a path to destruction. We look at Matthew 15, verse 11 and 17 through 20. It says, what goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean. But what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the thing that comes out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what makes a man unclean. But eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean other than right now during the coronavirus. So those are my words added to scripture on that, on that last part. But what is, what is James doing? 
He is telling us it is both hypocritical and foolish to bless God during a worship service. You know, to maybe you're standing there in your living room and you're praising God and blessing him. And then he says, right away after the service, then you go and curse someone made in the image of God. Have you ever found yourself doing that? On one moment, you're standing there and saying, you know, way maker and claiming all these things about God. And then you leave, in our case, the stamp building. Or if you're East Bridge, you leave the smile station and you see someone and you make a judgment call automatically. Maybe it's the homeless person on the street and think, man, that person. And you just make all kinds of assumptions about them. He says, church, this should not happen. It's easy in the midst of our gatherings, Sunday to Sunday, to sing praises. It's easy to do that. We're being led with great music by Jacob, and so it's easy to sing those songs, those words that are pulling the screen there. They may be even heartfelt, and we feel like we mean it. The problem is moments later when we are found speaking against someone, uttering a critical comment or gossiping, which can be equally as heartfelt. And James is saying, this shouldn't be so. He's like, church, there should not be this any part of your faith community that involves this. And here's the problem and almost the warning that I feel like he's giving us. Many of us do this without even noticing it. Many of us will go and we'll talk about someone or we'll gossip about someone. And we'll use that small little member of our bodies and we do it without even realizing it. And James is saying, church, this needs to stop. And then finally in verse 11, he says, does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can salt pond produce pond yield fresh water. So what he's, he throws out three ridiculous illustrations for us of natural contrast. And James is driving home the point that blessing God while cursing his people is not possible. That should not be possible in the life of a believer. Remember, James wrote this, this book and is addressing already Christians. And so if you're not a Christian this morning, then we're glad that you've joined us. And this may not make sense to you, but James really isn't expecting you to live this way. He's expecting you to do the things that he's describing here. But if you are a Christian church, he's saying, this should not be possible. Now springs, these, these illustrations he uses, they were key to survival at this time. Think about a dry Palestine and where the placement of villages and towns, they were kind of built around this idea of, of water and their presence and whether they could get fresh water. And he says, just as no tree would produce two kinds of fruit, so also a true Christ follower, a believer, would not produce both blessing of God and cursing toward others. And so if you found yourself doing that, if, if others would just say, you know what, I, I hear them saying this about God, but then I also hear them cursing people right away, then, then this morning you need to repent. And we invite you to repent of that. And James is saying a source of one kind is not going to produce something of two kinds. Fresh water comes from one source. We all understand that. And salt water comes from another source. We get that. It seems easy to understand, but our tongues are quite the opposite. Out of our mouths, with the use of our tongues, come both blessing and cursing, sometimes in the same breath. And so we think the product is therefore always a reflection of the source. Remember, what James has shown us for a couple weeks now is what's external, what you can see externally, what you can hear externally is evidence of what's actually happening internally. The fruit is always in line with its source. Remember, just a couple weeks ago, we said, well, you know that it's an apple tree because you see apples hanging from it. You, you know the tree by its fruit. You don't question if it's something different. He says the same when it comes to our tongues. What we say is an, what we say is an issue pre precisely because it reflects what it is that's going on underneath in our lives. If you want to know what someone's really like, spend some time listening to them talk. Just listen. Follow them around. <laughs> Go have, have coffee with them. You don't tell them that's what you're doing, but just listen to how they talk. Then you will know what's really going on inside of them. New Testament scholar Doug Moo. He says, bad things don't produce good things. And so a person who is not right with God and walking daily in his presence cannot consistently speak pure and helpful words. And we look at Matthew 12, verse 33 through 35. He says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. And so the uncomfortable conclusion for us is that an unchristian speech is evidence of an unchristian heart. 
because it actually reveals what we truly believe and what we are truly like. And so in summary this morning, what James has shown us is that our tongues are powerful, our tongues are destructive, our tongues are uncontrollable, and our tongues are revealing of what's actually going on. And so what we're going to see next week is we'll jump into the second part of chapter 3, and we're going to see that there's an acknowledgement of the problem, and he's going to hit on a provisional solution in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so I have four quick concluding application questions for you this week. Maybe write these down. I just want you to think through these on your own. The first one is, will I acknowledge the seriousness of my problem and take responsibility for my speech and my actions? In other words, will I accept the condition of my heart? If it's being revealed by my tongue that it's, it's something very different than what I claim, then will I take a, a, acceptance of those actions? And will I trust that Jesus can actually change me? The second question, will I look for the source to the solution? Here's the reality. We celebrated this last week and we get to celebrate it week in and week out, but Jesus Christ has already defeated your sin. Jesus Christ has already defeated your guilt and your shame. Here's what most of us do when we're looking for a solution. Most of us are looking for the next book. We're looking for the next podcast. Maybe right now we're looking for the next Zoom call that we can hop on as a solution to our problem. But God has already provided a solution in the person and work of Jesus. My third question is, will you develop a regular rhythm of asking? What do, you, what do I mean by that? I think if most of us spent half the time actually praying that we tell people that we're praying for them, that God would actually do something that God would actually show up and move and work. We just finished a, a prayer course at Sojourn. It took us, probably took us 12 weeks, but it was supposed to take us eight weeks, and we finally finished that up. And it was a reminder to, to ask God to change us, to ask God to change our hearts and to quit blaming our circumstances or those around us for what's going on and ask God to move and to work. And remember in James 1, he says, if we are quick to listen and slow to speak, so I think about what if we implemented that in every single relationship we have in our lives? So husband and wives, if you implemented that going forward, say, okay, we have, a, we have a new rhythm, rule of life in our marriage. What is it? We're going to be quick to listen and slow to speak. I imagine a lot of our arguments and fights would no longer exist. I'm not going to say all of them, but I imagine a lot of them, husbands, wives. I mean, you might say, well, I'm not married. Well, with your roommates or with your parents or whoever is you live with or just whoever you have, we all have relationships, whoever you have those relationships with, if you are quick to listen and slow to speak, I guarantee a lot of our problems, a lot of our arguments, a lot of our fights would actually go away. And the fourth question is, will I speak with love to others in word and deed? Remember this idea that, that we, we both have the word, but then we also want to live it out in, in our actions. It's easy for us to say that we love and care about one another, but do our actions, our works, and our words and our deeds actually line up with that? Do we actually live that out and do we actually show that to the world around us? So take those four questions, meditate on those this week. Maybe work through those in your small group or if you have a, 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 you know, another person you kind of do some discipleship with and just take some time to work through those questions this week. So let me pray for us and then we'll respond to Jesus. God, we once again thank you for this time that we can gather God, James got really practical on us this week as we looked at our tongues and our speech. God, if we're honest, that is one of the hardest members of our lives to control. It seems that we just naturally just easily throw these words out there that can be harmful. God, we find ourselves throwing out a blessing to you and praise to you and then a curse, sometimes in the same breath. And so God, we want to ask for forgiveness for that. Lord, help us to control our tongues. Help us to surrender that smallest member of our bodies over to you. God, that we'd even take every thought captive unto you. And Lord, that the world around us would know us by, yes, our, our, our words and our actions, our deeds, but God, and our speech and how it is that we uplift one another. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
going to have Jacob come back up and we'll respond uh, through one more song. And as always, prayer is available if you need it. And so um, sing this song of praise and let us know if you need prayer. Love you, church. All right, friends, we're going to close with um, a song I taught you guys a couple weeks ago called Graves and the Gardens. And the lyrics should be up there. So feel free to sing along. search the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough then you came along and you put me back together with every desire that um yeah i pray that in this time we can consistently look to you fix our eyes on you um and yeah like matt was saying be 
very quick to listen and slow to speak. That is exactly what Jesus was like. He was very good at listening, being present with people, and very slow to speak. And when he did speak, it really meant meant a lot. Um, yeah, I pray that we can be like Jesus in that way. I pray that we can read the scriptures and um, learn more about what Jesus was like, ultimately try to shape our lives to be like him. Um, we love you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Um, we'll see you on Zoom. I'll read out the meeting ID. It's 129-441-717. Um, I'll say it again. 129-441-717. We'll also put it in the chat bar, so it'll be good. <laughs> cool. See you there.